that the remainder will filter in the next two, three minutes, probably. This is a very festive room. <laughs> well, you could spread out in it. Yeah, that's true. Oh, this is great. It's good? Okay. Yeah. Oh, no. I think we're reaching critical mass here. 
Dr. Chris Davidson from Neuroradiology. And we really want to thank you for coming every year and giving us an update on neuroimaging because it's like so important to all of us Absolutely. in ophthalmology. My pleasure. So uh, this morning, in addition to uh, an imaging primer that's focused on neural ophthalm, we've added facial nerve as sort of a, an extension of the kind of things that you see in your cranial nerve uh, repertoire of, of diseases that you see. And I'm going to sit down, because you don't need to look at me, you're going to look at 30 anyway, that way I can see my screen. And I'll take this off so you can hear me. All right. So uh, we'll start with a, a brief reminder of our protocol strategy. And I call this imaging of the skull base uh, because it really is pretty much anywhere in the skull base uh, that we're looking, not just, not just orbit the central skull base, but the protocol is, is transferable to, to most any place in the head and neck, really. Um, we'll talk about the anatomy of the upper and midcranial nerves, and we're going to extend this as before to the facial nerve, but um, when you get facial, you get, you get vestibular cochlear as a, as a freebie, because they're really right in the same neighborhood. Uh, and then we'll talk about CT and MRI appearance of pathology, and for that, um, what we're going to have is we're going to have just a very quick list of, of the differential, but most of the cases are actually going to be part of the quiz. So um, we're, going to put you, we're going to put you on your game to see uh, how many of these things you might recognize. And you're still doing a quiz competition, is that right? Well, this year has been kind of a bit different. Okay, so, so it's, just, it's just bragging rights this year. Right, bragging rights. But that's still worth something. Okay, so... For MR imaging, which is kind of the mainstay for, for most pathology, I mean, for, for trauma, for simple cellulitis, um, CT has its, has its roles as a primary imaging approach, and for some things like if you look for calcification, but for the most part, for advanced imaging of neuro-ophthalmological conditions, we're really thinking about MRI. Now, this is what I call the six-pack of skull-based imaging. And what you have is you have two planes, axial and coronal, and you do three different sequences. You do a T1 pre, you do a T2 fat sat. Now, T2 fat sat can be done one of two ways. The, uh, the T2 fat sat, as labeled there, is just a spin echo sequence. The stir sequence, for all practical purposes, is the same thing, but done in a different way. And you don't really have to know how to, how to do these. In fact, for the most part, I don't go up to the machine and turn the knobs myself anyway. But the stir is a little bit more reliable in terms of fat suppression but it doesn't have quite as good of a spatial resolution. So we do one plane in one and another plane in the other. But when you see T to fat sat and stir, from, the, from a perspective of what they look like, they're pretty much the same thing. And then we do a T1 post, contrast fat sat, uh, axial and coronal. If you do these six sequences, you will see pretty much all the pathology that you, that you need to see. Now we add a couple of things on top of that. There's a sequence called a, 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 a kiss or a space, which is very high resolution, very heavily T2 weighted. And what we mean by that is the CSF is very bright and pretty much all the neural structures in the skull base are all dark. So you can't really see soft tissue differentiation or gray-white. Um, but what you see exquisitely is the CSF and anything running through them, i.e. cranial nerves and vessels. And you don't have some of the flow artifact that you get in the CSF with other sequences. We call that pulsation artifact when the bright T2 turns dark because there's some CSF motion. And then throw in usually a whole brain sequence uh, uh, to kind of wrap things out, depending on what you're looking for. So these are your this is your six pack. Upper left, this is a T2 fat suppressed. We know T2 is this because the is bright, fat is dark, and then the bottom one that's going to be a stir. You can flip those whichever one as uh, one stir that is T2. Middle we have our T1 uh, pre axial and coronal, and then on the right we have the T1 post. Um, axial and coronal. These are your these are your, are your money shots. Uh, this is that kiss or the T2 space sequence. You'll notice you don't see the brain uh, parenchyma all that distinctly. Everything's kind of kind of black. But what you do see is every single vessel. These nerves you can see them very very nicely. These are ultra thin. These are a sub millimeter uh, thickness and give you excellent resolution. Okay, so anatomy of the region. Uh, it helps to divide up the skull base into these four areas as kind of, you know, way to, to, to chunk it and, and get your arms around it. 
and then orient, orient these around the, the cranial nerves. Um, in this discussion, we're especially interested in the central skull base, uh, that's the upper to mid cranial nerves. Uh, that is the most complex area in terms of foramina, and mostly really where, where uh, ophthalmology lives is in, in the central skull base. Um, we're going to extend our, our discussion today to also include the temporal bone, which is uh, uh, the discussion that focuses around cranial nerve 7 and 8. So in the central skull base, the senoid bone is, is the, the, the anatomic um, foundation here uh, with its component parts. Uh, a lot of complex foramina, we'll review those on CT, uh, especially, it's easier to see the foramina on CT, but you need to know where they are on CT so that you could then, when you look at MR, know where they're supposed to be. Um, temporal bone, uh, it, it has also a, a fairly complex anatomy, the components of the temporal bone uh, that the petrous wear uh, immediately and where the, the inner ear sits, the, the mastoid and the, the squamous bone, which is part of the calvarium. And uh, it houses uh, the seventh and eighth cranial nerves, and of course the, the carotid artery. So if we look at this series of CT uh, images from uh, you know top left uh, superiorly and then uh, bottom right and inferiorly, let's, let's look at some of the component foramina. So these two right there, that's the optic canals, and sometimes optic canal versus superior orbital fissure can be uh, a little bit easy to mistake. So one thing to remember is these should be crossing. You've got a chiasm that's coming up there. So the optic canals are going to be on their way to form an X. That's an easy way to keep that apart. Plus, it's a little higher and more medial. Compare that to these two. Those are the superior uh, fissures. And uh, it's easy to miss. Uh, you know, when you're first looking at the image, you may think those are, are, are mistakable or for one another. But actually, if you look at the morphology, and the level, they are very clearly um, identifiable. That right there marks um, the course of the foramen rotundum. So foramen rotundum back here, it comes forward, and rotundum is directly in line with the uh, infraorbital canal. In fact, you can kind of think of the primary component of, of uh, V2 through rotundum going into the infraorbital canal. So you'll see them right in line here on an axial sequence. Um, down below, uh, this is foramen ovale, and that is um, uh, uh, housing uh, V3. It kind of goes straight down where all the other components of, of 5 are going forward. And um, right in front of that um, is the Vidian Canal. Now, the Vidian Canal is a distinctive canal. It's kind of um, easy to identify because it's got that sort of long sickle shape. It's usually visually distinctive, and because of that, people sometimes mistake it for rotundum, because it's easier to see and it shows up on more, uh, more, more distinctly as a canal, but you want to not make that mistake. Uh, there's the carotid canal. It has a kind of a complex course. Further inferior, this is the horizontal portion, kind of coming at 45 degrees here, and then um, the vertical portion of the petrous segment of the canal uh, right there. The IAC, pretty easy to identify there. And then just pointing out right there, those are the mastoid segments of the facial nerve. And they come straight down and exit at the, the base of the, of the skull uh, into the stylomastoid foramen. Can you remind us what goes through the vidian canal? Um, it's got, well, the vidian nerve, which um, is mostly um, autonomic. It's got components of, of the GSP, the greater superficial patrol. So let's go into the lacrimal, salivary, um, and, uh, um, Dr. Green, you're going to tell me why it causes headaches. Uh, well, because, I mean, the skull base anatomy is complicated all by itself, yeah. right? And then uh, the nerve itself is complicated because we don't study it very often. And um, and um, I, who's doing anatomy? Is somebody, are you going to cover this? The Vidian Canal. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to cover the Vidian Canal. Well, a little bit, but. The Vidian nerve? Yes. So, um, yeah. I mean, we just don't think about it in yeah. ophthalmology that much. I, 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 I've just heard that Vidian headaches is, is, is maybe, a, maybe a thing, but I don't know a lot about how it might be uh, related to um, what's in there. But it's mostly autonomic. Uh, GSP is kind of the primary component that, right. uh, 
it's coming off of, you know, the, so that, that's, well, look at that with facial nerve, nervous inter intermediates uh, coming through uh, the temporal bone, and then uh, it enters with the facial nerve and goes through, through uh, the GSP individually. We'll look at that when we get to the facial nerve. Okay, so can you just go through each of them really quickly again and... Um, me, me the arrows? What was that? You want to look at the arrows again? Yeah, or just, just go through each one and just come out each one again. Just okay, so <laughs> that's optic canal right there. That one you would know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's, that's actually one you got to know. Yes. The Vidian one, that's kind of <laughs> so, uh, down the line, but the optic canal is yeah. it's a must know. So optic canal there, superior fissure here and here. Rotundum. Rotundum is a little short thing, so you can miss it. If you're, if you're slicing it right, you might not even see it. But right in front of rotundum is this little pocket here. That pocket is the pterygopalatine fossa. And we'll see that on, on the coronal. That's kind of a crossroads where a lot of stuff is coming in and out. So that can help you find rotundum. Go right behind that and you'll see rotundum. Um, here is pterygopalatine fossa again here. Bottom part of, of rotundum. Um, that's carotid canal here and here. Down a little further, so so uh, vidian is going to be inferior. It's got this kind of long, sickle shape. It's a small canal, so you could also miss it as well, but it's quite distinctive. And you'll see how it's coming close to the carotid, the horizontal portion of the Peter's carotid canal right there. This is how I think of it. Um, the carotid canal, the, the carotid artery has sympathetic plexus that's kind of following it, it up right here. That's why you get... Um, why you get um, uh, um, corners uh, when you have a scoliosis fracture right there because you're, you're hitting the, the sympathetics. So think of it this way. The, the fibers from the sympathetic plexus right here are hooking up with fibers of GSP to make the Vidian canal. So the Vidian canal connects to the horizontal uh, carotid canal. So that's one way to, to, to remember it there. Oh, so that, that, so that would be the other thing that, that uh, the Vidian is made up of, GSP plus fibers from the carotid uh, plexus. Uh, this is ovale right here. Ovale goes straight down. Uh, sometimes you'll, just, you'll see people hold their hand up like this. This is facial nerve. Your hand is um, the, the ganglion. I'm sorry, not facial nerve, trigeminal. Hand is trigeminal ganglion. One and two go forward, three goes down. So mandibular V3 goes straight down like that. That goes through. Uh, Old Valley right there. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? So the Vidian, we talked about carotid, IEC, that's the math I'd say. We'll look at that a little more closely when we look at, at the temporal bone. Okay, so same thing coronal. This big space right here, that is the terrible palatine fossa. And you can see why we call it the crossroads because it interfaces with the intraorbital contents through the inferior fissure. Um, it, it gets into the deep face through the pterygomaxillary fissure right there. Um, it gets into the nasal cavity through the senopalatine foramen. So there's all this connection right here. So we often, when we're kind of orienting ourselves, we'll find the pterygopalatine fossa, and then you can move from there into the into all the adjacent structures. Going a little bit further back, so this is the, this is the most going from forward to back. Going back a little bit, so this is kind of a classic look of the central skull base foramina. So we're in the sphenoid sinus. These are the, are the um, uh, clinoid processes. And right there, those are the optic canals. Now because the optic canals are at an angle, they're not going to be perfect circles when you look at them in a straight coronal. They're going to be oval, and, the cir and it may even be an incomplete circle in terms of, of bone because it is at an angle. So but they're very recognizable here. And that they're on the upper inner margin from the optic strut. The optic strut is that little piece of bone that connects the clinoid process to the wall of the sphenoid. So this is the optic strut here. This is the optic canal. And then right below that, that's the superior orbital fissure. The strut separates the canal from the fissure. That right there is foramen rotundum. And again, it's a short canal, so you may only see it on one slice, but it's pretty distinctive right here just at the lateral margin of the sphenoid sinus, and then below and medial to that is the Vidian canal. That's the Vidian canal right there. Now, this piece of bone that houses the rotundum and Vidian is the pterygoid bone. And depending on how much 
aeration the person's sphenoids or sinuses are, you can have air that goes all the way down into this. So you have to be ready for this anatomy to get, to get a little distorted if you get an, an air recess from the sphenoid sinus into there. So that is Vivian right there. That is uh, ovale. And ovale is having these three which go straight down. Now, right there is kind of a big open chasm when you look at that. This person isn't perfectly even in the scanner, so um, if they're not lying perfectly even, then from side to side it might look asymmetric. That is foramen lacerum. Now, lacerum is something that mostly we learn in medical school when we're doing, you know, gr um, gross anatomy. Um, it doesn't really have much in it. It is a cartilage-filled plane that separates the brain from the deep face. But because it's cartilage, it shows up as, you know, kind of an empty spot on the CT. So just recognize that when you, when you see that, it's going to be kind of medial to where uh, ovale would be. That's not a pathology. That's not something um, eating the bone. That's, that's for animal serum. Uh, there's the carotid canal. It's a horizontal segment. Uh, and then there's the IAC. Again, this person is not perfectly even in the scanner, so you might see one IAC on one side and the other one on the other side. Um, so they're a little bit tilted. And then that right there, that's the uh, mastoid segment coming straight down out of the temporal bone. And then kind of round out the other foramen that we see here. This, the, the jugular bulb is kind of, it's got a lot of of directions to the way things come in. This, this, uh, the sigmoid sinus feeds the jugular bulb and then the jugular vein goes down from that. So it's kind of a, a big open space, but it usually has this contour along the top that we can recognize as the jugular bulb. Okay, so in 3D looking at it from the top, these, this is your clinoid. Uh, this is the optic nerve coming out of the canal. In the fissure we have three, four, six and V1 all going into the superior fissure. We have V1, I'm sorry, V2 coming straight forward into rotundum, uh, V3 going straight down. And then here are seven and eight in the IEC. And then nine, nine to 11 and 12 down further. Um, you've heard of the high heel footprint mark. That's one way to recognize um, ovale and spinosum. But spinosum doesn't have a lot going, it does have the middle meningeal artery but it's mostly as a landmark even you can see it. We call it the high heel foot, high heel footprint because it's recognizable as that on, on CT. Uh, from below, two, uh, the, the close relationship between the chiasm and the, and the stalk of the pituitary. Uh, the, uh, uh, the oculomotor, the third nerve, coming out above the pons and the uh, interparenchular cistern. Four, coming around the sides. Five, this great big beefy thing coming from the lateral margins of the pons, giving it three branches. Six, coming out underneath the pons and ascending near the midline. Uh, seven and eight, coming out at the cerebral pontian angle. And then nine, and then eleven, and twelve below. So the, the anatomic considerations, of course, they begin uh, at the, the brain, at the nuclear cortical origins. Uh, the extra axle, of course, uh, we can often see it in its cisterns. And it goes through the uh, skull base foramina, and then ultimately extracranial to the orbit and deep face and temporal bone. Finally, uh, to the end organ. So on uh, imaging then, cranial nerve uh, two is pretty easy to see, obviously, intraorbital. Um, in the coronal plane, again, we already talked about this. Here are your optic canals. Notice that there are ovals here. Um, optic strut, superior fissure there. It's much easier to see this on CT, but you may have to be able to recognize it on MR. So you fix this in your mind and then look at the MR, and there they are. So optic nerve here and here. So once you get used to that, you can recognize the pattern. The client process is a little harder to see because bone is, is, is dark on MR. Um, the, you know, the sinus has turned dark. All the bones are a little hard to see here. So just you, you recognize that morphology, and then you can see it uh, every time. Uh, going a little further back, the little optic chiasm and pituitary, and then uh, back toward the optic tracts. So if you get uh, a, a slice at an angle, you can actually see the chiasm in its you know proper form there as an X. But that orientation is not usually seen. The chiasm is at an angle about you know 15, 20 degrees like that. 
So if you want to get that picture, you have to do it a special way. We don't normally uh, get it that way, but sometimes if, if you know what the pathology is and you want to lay it out, you can, you can do that. Uh, midline anatomy, uh, important to recognize your, your landmarks here. Um, this is the optic chiasm uh, right there. This uh, it's relationship right in front of the infundibulum. And the best way to see this on, on MR is actually with a T2. We don't do a lot of T2 midlines, but if you're looking specifically for um, pathology um, at midline, this can be useful. Um, this is the third ventricle. Uh, into your commissure. To me, this looks like looks like the head of a bird. Um, that's the eye of the bird, and that's the beak. These two little um, CSF recesses, this is the chiasmatic recess, and this is the infundibular recess, because as you're forming the infundibular of the pituitary, there's a little pocket of, of fluid right there. And if you get a slice through that, you can see those recesses as little, as little holes. And then just to remind you, when you're looking at anatomy here, we kind of orient ourselves around the third ventricle. And one rookie mistake is to call that third ventricle. It's not. That's um, the second pelucidum. Uh, it's right below um, the corpus callosum. The third ventricle is this thing right there. And again, that's the, that's the head of that bird. Okay, uh, third nerve, nuclei in the midbrain right in front of the aqueduct. The nerves come forward, exit at the intraperitoneal cistern, cross between. Um, P1 segment and the superior cerebellar artery forward in the cistern into the cavernous sinus and finally into the, the superior fissure. Looking at this from the side, so here is your origin of the nucleus of, of three. It comes out, exits at the intraprotective cistern, kind of dives down a little bit underneath the P1 segment of the, of the, of the PCA into the cavernous sinus and, and then into the superior fissure in orbit. So remember that relationship right here of the nerve to these vessels. This is how you get aneurysms that can affect it right there. It's kind of caught in this little pocket of the, of the, of the vessels right there. You notice that the four is also close by, but it's not quite as, as, um, as kind of trapped by that. So on imaging, here you can see the nerves come out. Because they, they descend as they, as they exit the intraproductive cistern, you may not see them as a line, but these are the two nerves as they're just coming out. Coming forward, you can track it as it comes forward into the cavernous sinus. And then finally, as it, as it enters into the apex of the orbit, you see there's a little sleeve of CSF around it. That's the oculomotor cistern. And you can actually see that as an imaging feature on these uh, high-resolution T2 sequences. So in the coronal plane, here you have the basilar artery. Here's the SCA, right and left. Here's the P1 segment. There's the nerve right between the two. And then as you're coming forward, here's the, the third nerve in that pocket of CSF. That's the oculomotor cistern. And again, just reminding us of the relationship of, of the third nerve to the adjacent arteries. Now, with regard to possible uh, compression of that nerve from, from an, an aneurysm, we remember that uh, the third nerve has the uh, oculomotor components centrally. That, that little dot is, is the vessel. And then on the outside, you have the paras sympathetic sphincter fibers, which is why when you have extrinsic compression, uh, you get uh, pupil effects. Uh, four. So four has its, its nuclei very close to three, a little further down uh, near the aqueduct. They exit around the back and um, they can say it come forward. They have a fairly long course here in the perimesencephalic cistern. They also course between um, the SEA and the P1, and then kind of follow pretty close to three as they go forward. Because of this long course, and it's a relatively smaller artery, it is somewhat more susceptible to injury and trauma. From the side, again, here we see the fourth nucleus. It exits at the back, comes all the way around the side, perimesencephalic cistern, uh, between this gap between the arteries, into the cavernous sinus and superior fissure. So this is a small nerve, and you don't all necessarily always see it, but you can sometimes get lucky and catch it because it's coming around here. It's as much as important to know where it lives, because even if you can't see it normally, there is sometimes you can see pathology in it, and you know that it's going to come out, that this is going to be its course. Uh, you might even get lucky and see it in its uh, location that it's coming forward between the two arteries, but again, it's a, a small nerve and hard to see. This might be it over there.
Okay, uh, trigeminal nerve. This is this is a, a big nerve. It exits at the lateral mid pons. Uh, it's very easily identifiable. The ganglion sits uh, in the trigeminal um, uh, cistern or, or, or Meckel's cave and gives off uh, one, two, and three components. It's very easy to see. Even on routine brain imaging, you'll, you'll see it's a big fat tree trunk of vessel coming forward. And then this is uh, Meckel's cave, the trigeminal cistern. Um, it's You'll almost always see a little CSF pocket right there. If it's gone, then you have to think there might be, might be a master, especially if you're looking for a, a trigeminal abnormality. Um, you notice that the, the nerve fiber starts to um, kind of spread out here. So you'll often see, instead of, instead of a, a thick trunk, you'll start to see some individual fibers uh, in, in Meckel's cave right there. Um, six. So six has its nuclei at the, at the dorsal uh, kind of uh, mid-pons. Uh, back here at the anterior margin of the fourth ventricle. And we know, we know there's this relationship between the nucleus of six and then the fibers of seven that have to come around it, uh, causing the facial colliculus right here at, that, at the uh, um, uh, surface of the, uh, the, the ventricle. So six uh, comes forward through the mid-pons, and it kind of exits at the bottom of the pons right here. It ascends in the prepontine cistern, goes through this little... Um, dural uh, reflection called the Durellus canal, and then into the cavernous sinus and ultimately through the superior fissure. Uh, so here's the, uh, the nucleus of six. It exits under the pons and then ascends here in the prepontine cistern through the Durellus canal and then into uh, the cavernous sinus and ultimately uh, to the superior fissure. Now this is a small nerve, but you can usually see it because there's almost nothing else that lives right where it does. So it exits the bottom of the pons. So the slower slice is a little bit lower. So those two right there, that's six. It's right where it lives. It comes forward. And then as it enters into that Dorellus canal, you often see a little kind of a divot right there. Um, again, it's not so important to see it every time necessarily, but to know where it lives so that you can identify pathology there. And this shows the course of the of six coming under the belly of the pons, ascending up toward the Rolos Canal. So these are all of your um, uh, mid-cranial nerves coming through the cavernous sinus. Uh, you've got three up here and four, uh, V1, V2, lower down laterally. Uh, it's described that six is the one that is the most kind of floating inside the cavernous sinus, if you will, and therefore it might be perhaps the most sensitive to cavernous sinus pathology like a um, thrombosis, but usually if you have a cavernous sinus process, it's going to be getting more than just one cranial nerve, but sometimes you'll hear, hear people say that six is the first one affected for a cavernous sinus process. Um, okay, so now we're going to extend our discussion to seven and eight, and if you're going to talk about seven, you may as well talk about eight, because it, it, it uh, comes along with that discussion. So, again, that's the same picture of, of the nuclei here, six, seven, and eight. The seven nucleus and the fibers pass around the sixth nerve and exit into the lateral pons at the CP angle into the IC. And the cochlear fibers, along with nervous interme intermedius, that's a, the parasympathetic and, and autonomic stuff that's coming along with, with seven, are all going to exit together. And these two nerves are going to really uh, uh, be right next to each other the whole way uh, in the cistern and IAC. And in this drive from the front, so here at the pontomedullary junction, here's six ascending right there, seven and eight coming at laterally in the cerebral, cerebral pontine angle into the IAC. So um, seven and eight, uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on in, in the temporal bone. We've drawn them here as four different components. So the facial nerve is the biggest one right here. Um, eight has cochlear and then the two vestibular components. So we've kind of drawn them together here, but they all um, course through the IEC, and then once you get into the inner ear, then a lot starts to happen. So the facial nerve has a very um, interesting and complex course. This kind of outlines what it does in the temporal bone right there. Maybe we'll uh, do one more time. So there it is right there. It has the intracandelicular segment, and then right here as it enters the, the inner ear, this little short bit is the labyrinthine segment, and then it has a ganglion right there. That's the geniculate ganglion. And you see how there's a nerve coming off the front of that? That's the GSP, the greater superficial petrosal nerve. That's your autonomic fibers. They're going to hook up with, with carotid plexus fibers and together form the Vidian canal. 
The facial nerve then makes a hairpin turn and goes straight back, almost in a horizontal plane, uh, into the middle ear, and it's going to go back here and eventually, uh, in the magic segment, it's going to make a, a 90 degree turn and go straight down. So it's a very complex nerve, and you wonder why um, you know, Mother Evolution decided to put it there, but it is a really complex um, uh, uh, set of compresses to, to keep track of. So on imaging, this is a T2 space. You will see usually two component nerves. Uh, the facial and the, and the vestibular cochlear will usually show up as a single trunk here, but as it goes further into the IEC, we can, we can see it split apart. Um, if you're going to have um, a diagnostic quality image of this type, you really need to see those, those two. In fact, the identification of those two nerve components is usually how we, how we uh, you know, uh, QA this to make sure that, that it's a good enough scan uh, to be diagnostic. You see, you also get good fluid signal, and you actually see the components of the uh, of the of the inner ear. And this is more of an ontologist world, but you can even see the components of the cochlea, the scala tympani and scala vestibuli, uh, inside the cochlea on this this sequence. So this is a, a a diagram showing what it looks like. You're from the imagine that you're uh, in, on the brain side looking into the IAC, and you're looking at the very lateral tip or the fundus of the IAC. So, um, anterior to the left, uh, this is your inner ear with the, uh, um, the components of the, of the vestibule and the canals. And at that very end, the, the tip or fundus of the IEC, you have four component nerves. This one here is the facial nerve. Now, if this drawing were more accurate, the facial nerve should be bigger. It's the biggest nerve here by far. Um, the cochlear nerve is below it and in front. And then behind it are these two small components of the vestibular nerve. So we have facial nerve here, cochlear nerve of eight here, and then the two vestibular components right there. Now this may seem like microanatomy, and it kind of is, but on imaging, you can actually see those things. Um, you've got the facial nerve here, so anterior is on the left, posterior on the right, and you're looking straight lateral. This is not quite a true satchel, but it's essentially a satchel plane. Um, it's that, that's the orientation right there. So that's a slice, and you can see these four components, facial, cochlear, and the two vestibular components. The two vestibular components may be kind of joined up a little bit. Um, and, and this relationship is, is really uh, very predictable, and, and, and you can, when we're looking for facial or, or uh, cochlear abnormalities, uh, this image helps us uh, get really a, a good look at things in there. So seven, uh, the cochlear of eight, and then... One thing you've heard people say is to remember these, um, seven up, coke down. So the, the facial nerve is the one on top and the cochlear nerve is the one down at the bottom here. And then um, the superior and, inf and inferior uh, divisions of the vesicular nerve. So those four nerves are the component parts of, of uh, the cranial nerves in the IAC. On CT, um, we've got these two canals right there, uh, components of the facial nerve. So again, the fundus of the IAC, this is the labyrinthine sitting with the facial nerve. You've got the ganglion sitting right here. Usually the, the ganglion kind of has a little gap in the bone right there. If we could see GSP, it would be coming off right there. And then it turns back, makes its hairpin curve, and there is the horizontal or the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. It runs right underneath the semicircular canal. And it has this characteristic angle, about, you know, like about a, you know, 50 degrees right here. Very identifiable. It may not be a perfect horizontal plane, so you may not see the entire thing in one slice, but it's nearly horizontal right there. Now, the mastoid segment is something that can be hard to see. So here, it, here is a, a two images from an MRI in the axial plane, and if you were to say, well, show me where the mastoid segment of the facial nerve is, um, it would be hard uh, to say. This is kind of like when we're talking about the optic canal. You learn the anatomy on CT. So this is the mastoid segment of the facial canal right there. It comes straight down from the posterior part of the tympanic segment and exits at the stylomastoid foramen. Um, it's got a lot of air cells around it, but on CT, um, unless, well, if you have fluid in the, in the mastoid, it can be a little confusing, but it's a, it's a soft tissue-filled canal uh, that exits right there at the stylomastoid foramen. You can usually see the stylic process as it's coming out. So now that you know where that is, you go back to MR, and you can identify it. The reason why that's important is because when you have a disease from the the deep face, especially the parotid that is ascending 
uh, and effect in the facial nerve, you need to be able to identify the stylum acid frame, because that's sort of the first place where you can see like a mass or perineural tumor uh, facing the fat right there. And then the, the facial nerve enters the parotid and then splits up and then it has this you know, very complex relationship with, with the deep face, the parotid, and all of its uh, component branches. And if we look at one more anatomic drawing of, of the facial nerve, so these represent the, uh, the, the nuclei uh, in the, the brainstem. Uh, so you've got the, the primary uh, motor components of the facial nerve here in, in orange coming through. And this kind of shows you what it's doing as it's coming through the, the uh, labyrinthine, tympanic, and mastoid segments, exiting the salamastoid foramen, and then these are the branches of the facial nerve that are the primary motor components, you know, the ones that, that really um, get the most attention. But you've got these autonomic components um, you've got a uh, special sensation uh, for, for taste that's coming through uh, and giving this little branch of the cord tympani that has this very bizarre course lacing through the, um, uh, the ossicles. Uh, and then also uh, these are, are, are autonomic fibers from um, giving off the, this is the nervous intermediate. So there's actually, there's a fifth nerve. We, we talk about the four nerves in the IC. Technically, there's a fifth one. Um, I don't know that we're going to really see it distinctly. Um, right? So technically, there's a fifth nerve in there, the nervous intermediate, but usually it's such a small nerve, you don't really see it. But if you saw, you could, there have been times when we've seen it, we think, oh, we think that's the nervous intermediate. The nervous intermediate? Um, yeah. But technically, that is that is uh, passing through the IEC, and then that, that's the, the giving these components to the GSP. So there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on here, which is why sometimes you have these these overlapping uh, neurological findings uh, affecting uh, diseases that are uh, that are involved in the facial nerve. And then one more complexity um, uh, is the relationship between uh, the uh, the third branch of the trigeminal nerve. So there's the mandibular nerve there. There's actually this connection between the mandibular nerve and the facial nerve through the um, auricular temporal nerve. And so you can have perineural tumors that hops from five to seven, seven to five. And when that happens, this is the culprit right there. Okay, so let's talk about some pathology. First, I'll give you just a, you know, the laundry list. Um, we'll start with, with uh, the, uh, the optic nerve and visual disturbance. Um, you have intrinsic tumors of, of the optic nerve, uh, you have the, the nerve sheath. Any kind of orbital neoplasm could affect the nerve. And when you get intracranially, the pituitary, um, a very common uh, uh, neoplasm affecting uh, vision. Um, on the inflammatory side, you can have demyelination, you can have pseudotumor, you can have granulomatous uh, inflammation. And then on the vascular side, you can just have you know, good old-fashioned ischemia, uh, either microvascular affecting the nerve or you know, stroke affecting the brain. Okay, so now we get into, into some quizzes. So, uh, Dr. Drew, do they need to keep the score for themselves, or is it... Yeah, we can keep their own score. If, if you want, we can just kind of... We can, I'll go through all these at the end, but we have about 20 questions we're going to go through. So question number one, uh, what is the diagnosis? So um, we'll say that this is an older child who has mild vision impairment. On the left is a T2 fat sat. On the right is a T1 post-contrast with fat sat. And I will tell you that on the pre-contrast, this was not right. So this is enhancement. Um, T2, T1. So, um, you don't have to say it out loud. We'll, we'll, we'll go back over all and, and, and we can uh, get the answers. Okay? Do you want them to answer? Oh, if you want to write it down, uh, or do, if you're not going to keep score, we can just, just do this uh, informally at the end. But I want to go through them all at once and then we'll, do, we'll get the answers and, and, and go through them all again. Okay, this is still question one. Maybe the same history, different patient, but maybe the same history. Older child with mild vision impairment. Um, this is a post contrast T1, not fat suppressed, but it is post contrast. So, same, same diagnosis as the first uh, images. Okay, question two. Um, this is a CT on the left and a T1 post contrast. On the right, and the history of this might be a middle-aged woman with slowly progressive painless vision loss. 
Okay, question three. This is, um, uh, let's, let's say it's, it's uh, a similar history, um, sold in progressive vision loss. Um, this is a T1 post contrast fat suppressed. In this case, we had a follow up two years later. Dr. Degree, that is your patient. That's my patient. Uh, two years later, and some steroids, and we this happened. do remember scans. Okay. Yeah, these, these are like our children, we remember their patients. <laughs> So what's the diagnosis in this case? Okay, um, question four. This is a middle-aged woman with uh, known metastatic breast cancer, and she has uh, bilateral uh, decreased vision, visual acuity. So what's the diagnosis? And I'd like to be as specific as possible in terms of um, what kind of, this diagnosis is not sounds a generic word, but you could be a little bit more specific in describing what, what kind of this is. And this is a T1 post-contrast coronal with fat suppress. Okay, uh, question five. This is a younger middle-aged patient with acute painful vision loss on the right. What we have is a, a stir on the top, T2 fat sat, and a post contrast T1 fat sat on the bottom. And as a bonus on this one, I'm going to give you one more picture to help you with the diagnosis. So technically, the, the, the differential is pretty broad here, but when you add this, it makes the diagnosis uh, uh, more, if not pathognomonic, maybe close. Okay, this is a patient who has a history of medically treated hyperprolactinemia, but presented with sudden acute vision loss. So we want to know what the diagnosis is, including the secondary diagnosis with the, 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 uh, the sudden onset. This is a coronal, and importantly, it's a coronal T1 without contrast. It's important. No contrast here. Okay, uh, this is a, uh, example. This is a very tragic case. This is a uh, younger middle-aged male who underwent an extensive skull-based uh, surgery for a neurosurgical problem. I think it was a, it was a massive meningioma that the episode was found. Woke up totally blind bilaterally. Uh, this is an axial diffusion sequence. So what's the diagnosis here? Okay, uh, let's talk uh, ocular motor pathology. Uh, so, again, we have inflammation, pseudotumor, granulomatous, thyroid eye disease. Um, demyelination, if it's uh, centrally, you can, you can affect uh, motor function. Um, you have tumors, uh, lymphoma, lacrimal, and orbit, meningioma, uh, schwannoma, mess, perineural tumor, and then uh, vascular aneurysm, especially with, with certain ocular motor nerves, fistula. Thrombomolic disease, and again, uh, anything intracranial could affect uh, the, the nerves as well. Okay, question eight. This is a patient with uh, limited extraocular uh, motor function uh, on the left. At least the patient knows the most on the left. In your clinic, you might have you might have found something on the right as well, but left is really what the patient was. And what, the, and what the referring provider noticed, but you might find more. Okay, uh, this is a patient, I should have said that this is a T1 post contrast with fat suppression. Okay, uh, both of these are T1 post contrast with fat suppression, axial on the top and coronal on the bottom. This is a patient with painful acute ophthalmoplegia on the right involving multiple cranial nerves, okay? And if you can give us an eponym for this, we, you know, we don't do a lot of eponyms, we try to get away from them, but this is a kind of a cute one, so 
Okay, this is a patient who has somewhat similar um, ophthalmoplegia on the left, I'm sorry, on the right, but in this case, it's painless and slowly progressive. The last patient was acute and painful. This is painless and progressive ophthalmoplegia on the right. This is an axial T1 post contrast and a coronal T1 post contrast, both with, with fat suppression. And as a bonus, there's an ancillary finding here. Oh, I thought originally the diagnosis was an ancillary finding. <laughs> well, that means you found both. That's good. Okay. Um, this is a patient um, who presented with painless proptosis and limited extraocular motor function and, and apparent mass effect on the right. And interestingly, uh, importantly, this is this was painless. And you can maybe think to yourself, uh, would the diagnosis be different? What might the di diagnosis be if it were painful instead? But this one was painless and did not appear inflammatory. Um, this is an axial uh, diffusion sequence uh, through the, through the midbrain. Um, the, the, I love the pons actually, and. This is a patient with a, a hypertension and microvascular disease presented with an acute classic gaze disturbance. So, so the question here is, what is the gaze disturbance? And maybe for bonus, um, what is the what is what is the, the fiber tract here that's, that's famous for doing this? Um, okay, so this is uh, these are two. Uh, T1 post contrast. This is a patient with uh, chronic uh, painless diplopia related to um, a nerve malfunction on the on the left. And I'm not going to tell you which nerve because you're going to tell me that. But the question is, what's the diagnosis? And maybe another ancillary finding here. This is a coronal T1 published uh, through the orbit. Okay, um, question 15. This is a 3D reconstruction from an angiogram, an internal carotid injection, uh, looking basically uh, laterally. Uh, the question is, what is the artery sh shown here the, at the base of which is this aneurysm? So what is this artery? And for question 16, uh, is the pupil spared or involved? in this person's uh, 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 nerve dysfunction. Okay, question 17. Uh, this is a patient with acute, with uh, severe conjunctival injection following a uh, significant head injury. I think this is my patient too. This is your patient too? Yeah. <laughs> so here's a carotid injection here. Um, this is the angiogram from the side and this is a uh, uh, post contrast CT. Okay, facial nerve pathology. Um, we have some congenital things, uh, epidermoid lymphoma, uh, intracranially, uh, any number of temporal bone abnormalities, uh, tumors, especially schwannoma, perineural malignancy coming from the, the uh, parotid, especially inflammatory conditions, uh, neuritis either infectious or non-infectious, um, otitis, uh, uh, when you have mast uh, otomastoiditis, uh, peritis. Then vascular, um, you, you can't have loop impingement intracranially. There's something called a hemangioma, which you're probably not really familiar with unless you've done an ontology rotation or uh, some work there. And then, uh, again, anything on, on the nature of thrombo, the or ischemic disease in the brain. Okay, so this is a patient with uh, slowly progressive hearing loss and mild facial weakness on the left. Let's say they're probably a, maybe a you know, younger adult or middle-aged adult. This is a T2 sequence on the left and then a diffusion on the right. Okay, this is another patient with um, hypertension, diabetes, uh, microvascular disease with an acute lacunar infarct. Uh, this is a, a diffusion image, and the question is, in this location, which cranial nerve or nerves 
I'm going to get back in. Uh, question 20. So here we have an axial T1 post contrast and then a sagittal T2 of the cervical spine. These are the same patient. So the question is, well, kind of implied in the question is, is that you know what the diagnosis is, but what are the three tumor types associated with this syndrome? And as a bonus, we'll give you the, uh, the, the acronym that we, that we use for remembering the syndrome, the MISME. Okay, uh, question 21. This is a patient who presents with acute facial palsy on the left. And the question is, what kind of doctor was Sir Charles Bell? Um, question 22. This is a patient who presents with um, hearing loss on the right uh, relatively rapid onset, but um, consistent after the presentation. Question is, what is the most common nerve of origin for this fairly common tumor? Uh, okay, here's a patient with facial palsy on the left. We have a CT scan on the left, and on the right we have um, a T1 post contrast fat depression. And the question is, what segment of the facial nerve is involved? And um, as a double bonus, if you recognize this tumor, this is, this is a hard one, but if you, there are some characteristic features of this that kind of tell us what it is, but it's an unusual tumor, but it's distinctive if you happen to know what it is. Uh, and question 24, this is the last one. Here we have a patient with a facial palsy and a big old mass in the parotid. The question is, what primary salivary, and actually into that not um, commonly salivary and lacrimal tumors, they have, this, they have a lot of the same epithelial kinds of malignancies that occur in them. What uh, salivary tumor is infamous for causing perineural tumor? And when you have it either in the parotid or the lacrimal, you really worry about, about perineural tumor. And we worry about it with anything, but especially this one. And, and I'm, a, I'm asking for a primary because squames will do perineural tumor, wherever they are, but we're we'll looking at the primary epithelial tumor here. Okay, so I have I know, do you have more questions? No, we're fine. Okay. We're fine because we've got two hours. Okay. And we, and we have this seventh nerve afterwards okay. that uh, I think residents are going to do. Okay, well, so you're fine for time. Okay, we'll back, back to the question again. Um, oh, by the way, this is, this is what it looks like in a good year. I don't, I don't think we're there, we're there yet, are we? Okay. This, this is going to be pining for, for what could be, so let's go back to the questions here. That was it. Anybody recognize that? That's, that's Wolverine Cirque up above Brighton. Okay. So what's the diagnosis? Yeah, osteopathic glioma. These can have a, a wide range of, of appearances. Um, this big, fat, sausage, tubular thing, you can start to get kind of kinked in it. Uh, brought in T1, but you can have some heterogeneity. And has, can be quite variable. This is one of those, um, you know, CNS tumors that breaks the rules of enhancement. They can enhance and not be malignant. Um, so there's quite a bit of variability. And, you know, as an example of that, here's a patient with bilateral optochiasm pathway glioma that has almost no enhancement. Um, and interestingly, and you, you obviously know this, but these can look really big and bizarre and have relatively minor um, impact on vision. Um, so that, there's a lot of, of variability, but bilateral, unilateral, any part of the optic pathway. Okay, what's the diagnosis here? Shout it out. So, yep. Yeah, so, so the, the tram tracking of the calcium... That right there is kind of the, that's kind of the, the epitome of an optic nerve meningioma, uh, optic nerve sheath meningioma. And on the MR, you'll see it enhancing. Um, they tend to be um, circumferential around the nerve, but they could be eccentric. It could be bigger on one side, so it may not be a perfect two lines of tram tracking, but 
the point is, is that it's on the periphery of the nerve. It's, we call it optic nerve meningioma, but it's more properly optic nerve sheath meningioma. And, you know, not, not uncommonly, if you get a lesion on MR and you're not sure, you can go back and get the CT after the fact to look for the calcification, because that'll really, really nail it for you. Um, and this, this patient, this is many years ago, Dr. DeGree's patient, um, when we first saw this, the history wasn't really clear, and we thought, well, maybe this is a big old meningioma. But then, with some steroids in time, this thing disappeared. So, what is it? Pseudotumor yeah. uh, is what we ended up concluding this was, but it could have been something else that was uh, that was mass-like and, and inflammatory that would respond to steroids. Like maybe a sarcoid. Uh, Dr. Gree, have you ever seen a sarcoid disappear this completely? I guess they can. I don't think she had sarcoid. I think it was a pseudotumor. Yeah, it was it was idiopathic, was inflammatory, but it really looked like a tumor. Yeah. It just goes to show you why pseudotumor is well named because it can sure it can sure fool you uh, depending on the presentation. Um, so this is our patient with the, the metastatic breast cancer. The abnormality here, of course, being that you have these abnormal enhancement surrounding the entire nerve. Now, if you had a different history, you might have called that an optic nerve sheath meningioma. It could look just like that, but in her case, bilateral metastatic breast cancer. So what do we call this? Yeah, leptomeningeal carcinomatosis, because the, the, the metastasis is in the leptomeningeal spaces, and you can imagine how devastating this would be and how, how much impact this could have on vision. All right, this is our patient with uh, acute right optic neuritis and this finding. So they have, yeah, this is kind of a classic presentation for MS. Uh, this is our patient who was being treated medically for a uh, prolactinoma, and they presented with sudden vision loss. So. So the, so the diagnosis is prolactinoma, but what's the secondary diagnosis here? Dr. Kennedy just had a case of this. Apoplexy? Yeah. Pituitary apoplexy is one of the few neuroimaging emergencies because they have to be, the second you find this, they have to be decompressed right away um, so that they, you can spare their vision. So these, yeah. these are ones that you never, ever sit on these, and, and whatever time of the day or night it is, you call somebody. Or we, we call somebody, and then you... And then we go to bed and you fix it. And the guy we saw went for weeks misdiagnosed, yeah. and he's probably got a permanent bitemporal. And the key here is this is a T1 pre-contrast. This is hemorrhage. Um, you can also, so when we have acute vision loss in the coronal plane, we look at the hemorrhage on T2. We will also do a gradient sequence in the coronal plane to see if we can uh, find blood inside the tumor. So it's basically hemorrhage into a pre-existing tumor that's causing the apoplexy. And you can see that the... And the problem was that they kept thinking that it was enhancing, mm -hmm. an enhancing adenoma. Right. So but that was an unenhanced T1 scan. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a thinking error uh, on the part of the people who had this guy. You can, you can imagine how much the optic chiasm is being affected right over this, this hemorrhage right there. On 2-1, is the blood as obvious that you bleed, or is this just obvious because it's... I mean, usually by, by the time several hours have passed, the blood starts to go from um, a state where it's very hyperacute blood. It may be um, inconsistently bright, but usually by the time we get the imaging, there's going to be some bright signal to it. But that's also why we throw in the gradient, because the gradient will show blood... The, but we'll have signal void in it. Um, and between the T1 and the T2, the irregularity of the signal and the gradient, you can usually tell that it's blood, but it can be a little tricky depending on how old it is. You're saying, like, as opposed to T2, or as opposed to, like, CT? Mm -hmm. I remember Sarab telling us if it's, if it's bright on T1, then it's subacute. So I was wondering if, like, if, like, a hyperacute bleed would be hard to differentiate, but it sounds like very early on it becomes bright on T1. Yeah, I mean, very early on, it won't be bright just yet. I mean, it's the med hemoglobin that turned that it's really bright, so you need, you know, several hours for that to happen. So it could be that if it's super acute, you might not see it. But usually with the other sequences and the suspicion, um, you'll, you'll be able to figure it out. 
Uh, this, this is that tragic case of, of uh, uh, the patient who woke up blind after an extended surgery. Um, what do we call this? Yeah, this is posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Really a devastating outcome. And I'm not a surgeon, so I don't, I don't deal with this, but when you have extended surgery, do you, do you routinely consent patients for this, even though it's very, very rare? Is it, it's a, it's a, well, so we don't do the surgeries that cause this. I, I guess it's it's really, back surgery and these prolonged surgeries that people get into where there could yeah. be blood loss. Um, but this is, oh, I hate this diagnosis. It's horrible. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a big, I guess it's big head and neck stuff, skull base stuff, upper spine. It may have to do with positioning of the patient upright, um, venous congestion, things like that. Yeah, but and back surgery. And then trauma, post-bad trauma with a lot of blood loss. So this is, so this is very uncommon. You'll, you'll almost never see this. Uh, distinguish this from anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, where you won't see this. You might see nothing on, on AION. You might see a little dot of enhancement at the back of the globe, and maybe that's it. And the, and like the abnormal enhancement is the nerves, correct? What's that? Is the nerves, and yeah. then this and is then, this is actually diffusion restriction in the nerves themselves. Yeah. yeah, and when you see this, you kind of panic because well, this is a nerve that is that is that is dying. Very unhappy. Yeah, yeah. In the nerve itself. And then, is there anything also posterior to that, like in the region right behind it, or is it just the nerves? Like, like this right here? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of, of noise in the skull base. Uh, mucus in the sinus sinus can look bright on, on diffusion. So we have to be careful not to get distracted by um, extracranial things um, that have diffusion, like uh, secretions in the sinuses. Um, in the parotid, like Warthin's tumors, will, will be very uh, will, will have some diffusion. Um, cysts and things will, will uh, if they if they have certain material in them, uh, blood will, will will have diffusion restriction. So sometimes stuff that's not neural, you have to kind of do a double take and say, is that diffusion restricted for some other reason? When we're talking about neural structure, diffusion equals ischemia. Yeah. Um, if, if, if it's bona fide PION and you get a, a, a diffusion, you, sh you should see positivity, yeah. It's, it's the same sensitivity as stroke. And what are you going to see if you get called to see somebody who claims they're blind? What are you going to see on exam that's going to tell you what's going on? Okay. It may look normal. It may look normal. Yeah, the eye, the nerve may look normal, and the retina may look normal. I mean, it may look completely normal. But the key will be that the pupils don't work right, right? The pupils are going to be more fixed. They're going to have no, no or little response to light. Um, but they'll have a good ear response. And uh, but but when you look in acutely, you may see nothing. It could be normal. And that's where it's such a hard diagnosis to, to get. Okay, moving on to uh, ocular motor pathology. Um, question eight: What is the diagnosis? Yeah, so be, because the uh, uh, the distribution of disease is so characteristic, um, we talk about IMSLO, IMSLO as the preferential involvement of the ocular muscles, inferior and medial especially, then superior. So IMS, those really are the three most common, um, lateral and oblique, much less common. And certainly if you have an isolated lateral muscle, it's not going to be a thyroid eye disease. But this is, this is pretty... Um, uh, characteristic. And even if we don't see it on both sides, most of the time, pathologically, the other side's going to be involved as well. So even though they can be asymmetric on an imaging, you could easily have bilateral findings. And when they, get, when they get in the clinic and they get a proper eye exam, you'll notice that there's right symptoms as well as left symptoms. But in this case, the left is clearly abnormal. The right, maybe that inferior right is a little too fat. Okay, so this is our patient with
acute painful ophthalmoplegia on the right involving multiple cranial nerves. So, what's this? It's Toulouse-Hunt. Yeah, Toulouse-Hunt, which is, you know, basically a, a variation of a pseudotumor. These can be really subtle, and, you know, we've seen this mist before. You have enhancement of the cavernous sinus, and you can imagine that maybe the patient's a little asymmetric in the scanner, and you look at that and you go, oh, that's just some cavernous sinus. And, and in fact, there are patients with a finding that might look like this that don't have anything. It just happens to be the vascularity or there's a venous um, prominence right there that looks like pathology. So the pathology, uh, the symptoms drive this. If the patient has acute ophthalmoplegia and clinically looks like Toulouse Hunt, and this finding, in this case, it's, it's pretty um, characteristic, but you have in the anterior cavernous sinus headed toward the superior fissure, you have this asymmetric enhancement. So that's, that's Toulouse Hunt. Can you stay on the axial view too, the cavernural yeah, that's it right there. Oh, okay. It's oh, subtle. It's subtle. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's easy to miss. And again, you'd look through multiple slices and convince yourself that it's a little more compelling right there. Notice how if we use our anatomy, there's the superior, there's the clinoid, there's the optic strut, optic nerve right here. This is smack in the middle of the superior fissure. Okay, so this is the other patient with a kind of similar presentation in that they have ophthalmoplegia on the right, but theirs is painless and progressive. Yeah, this, this is a great appearance of a, of a paracavernous meningioma. Pretty commonplace to see them too. You can see it along the margin of the sinus. The meningioma enhances maybe a little less than the pituitary and less than the, the uh, venous blood of the cavernous sinus, but it is pretty intensely enhancing uh, in a you know, prime position here to affect multiple cranial nerves. Okay, so this is a patient with a painless proptosis and a limited uh, EOM. And this is more of a differential than a specific diagnosis. The fact that it's painless maybe helps a little bit here. Um, any guesses? There aren't many wrong guesses here, but... So in this case, so pseudotumor would be a great option. Pseudotumor uh, sarcoid, especially with, especially with the intracranial component here. Sarcoid, um, pseudotumor IgG4. In this case, I give the history of pain less, which makes it more likely to be lymphoma. So there's a lot of overlap between lymphoma and granulomatous and pseudotumor um, from an imaging point of view, but clinically you can probably tell them apart. But this one was lymphoma. But with a different history, this could have been sarcoid. Um, could have been pseudotumor, could have been IgG4. Okay, so this is a patient with a microvascular infarct uh, of the brain stem. What's the classic gauge disturbance? I know, and, and what, what lives right there? Yeah, this, I mean, this is kind of a cute case. You, know, you don't normally get a, a liquid infarct, it just happens to pick off the MLF, but this was one with, with a classic presentation. If it were a little bit bigger, you could get a gaze palsy, right? Because uh, if you involve the uh, six nerve nucleus, you're going to see, and PPRF, you're going to see a gaze palsy. One and a half. And a one and a half, correct. Okay. Um, this is a patient with chronic painless diplopia. And we, if you want me to start with the ancillary finding, what's the ancillary finding? Superior oblique atrophy. Yeah, check it out. Superior oblique atrophy. This muscle is really small. Uh, what lives right here? Yeah, that's exactly where the fourth lives. So this is going to be a presumptive diagnosis of a yeah, for, uh, a schwannoma. Um, <laughs> what, 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 what did you say? I was thinking of. So, so uh, the, the history was, was chronic painless um, trochlear palsy. Um, this is a presumptive diagnosis of a, of a fourth schwannoma. We don't get a lot of path on these because you can't possibly make it any better by operating on it. Um, but any, we've seen any number of these, and um, they all kind of occur right here um, or in, in, this, in this location. So a fourth schwannoma is a presumptive diagnosis. I suppose that, you know, autopsy could find that, but... 
Um, these are small. They last for years and years. They don't grow much. Um, and so this is a, a presumptive diagnosis of a trochlear schwannoma. You get a fourth nerve palsy with these, but um, they usually don't grow. I mean, they just kind of stay small like this. And if, if a surgeon goes after this, he can do nothing but harm the patient. Because this is a very difficult place to get to, and it's not going to fix the fourth nerve. You're better off doing strabismus surgery down the line and fixing them, you know, aligning the eyes with muscle surgery. a chronic nerve palsy to either congenital or um, like a more benign pathology, but um, sometimes we'll get imaging just to rule out a schwannoma and I've never actually seen one, so this is cool that they can happen. But usually we tell the patient that no matter what, we'll probably still send them to a business surgeon because they'll fix this in play if, it's, if it doesn't grow. And you know, over time, you probably get a scan every few years to make sure. Occasionally we see schwannomas that do weird things and get big and cause mass effect, but Mostly these are little tiny things. Okay, so what is this artery? Posterior shrink. Yes, PCA. Now, in this case, uh, the aneurysm is associated with a huge PCOM. In fact, PCOM is so big we call this fetal origin. Um, it, it's a, a little bit of a misnomer when we call when we call these. Um, you know, uh, posterior um, uh, cerebral artery um, aneurysm because the aneurysm is actually coming off of the carotid. It's coming off of the the base of the of the PCOM, the, 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 the PCOM aneurysm. So technically, it's an ICA aneurysm, but but they're right there at the origin of the PCOM. And when you have a PCOM that is so big, it, it becomes a fetal origin PCA. Um, then you have a flow-related phenomenon, and oftentimes these things are associated with that because it's a flow-related effect. But the PCOM aneurysm is at the IAC at the origin of the, of the, of the, of the uh, PCOM, and then the, the PCA is coming off. So this is the, the PCA, and this is a, kind of a classic big PCOM aneurysm. Pupil is? Oh. Okay, so this is the patient with a severe contractile injection uh, after a uh, head injury. What is this? CC fistula, and, and more specifically, a direct. But here you can see on the carotid injection, um, you, you're barely even filling out the branches of the MCA here, and you're already filling up the cavernous sinus, and you're pushing contrast into this huge structure right there. What is this? Yeah, so the SOV is just, it's got retrograde flow. It's, it's filling up faster than the, than the cerebral arteries are, so this is uh, a direct CC fistula. Okay, facial nerve pathology. This is maybe a little bit more out of your comfort zone, but the, but you asked for it, so we can do it now. This is kind of an imaging classic. Um, this patient has slowly progressive hearing loss and facial weakness, and you have an almost imperceptible mass here. It's the mass effect as much as anything else that's causing the appearance on the T2. What's characteristic is this here, diffusion restriction in a cistern-based mass. I mean, I'll tell you this also did not enhance. Anybody recognize this? If it were a schwannoma, it would enhance. Now, schwannomas can have um, bright signal. They tend to be darker than CSF. This thing is bright, 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 and there's zero enhancement. On a CT, it might be invisible also. It's the, the diffusion is what gives us away. This is an epidermoid tumor. This is a congenital rest of, of epithelial tissue. And um, since they're congenital, you know, it takes many, many years for them to grow. They often present as a person as, as an adult, depending on how big they are. Um, but uh, they have this characteristic diffusion restriction. They grow very, very slowly. And eventually, they'll start to compress what's around them. And in this location, uh, this patient got um, uh, seven and eight affected. And this could be, um, uh, besides facial weakness, you could also see hemifacial spasm if it hits the, uh, the uh, root exit zone. Yeah, good point, yeah. You're saying that the image on the left is T1 post, sorry, T2 
this is a diffusion sequence. Oh, on the, on the, on the left. I'm sorry, left, left. This is a T2, uh, uh, bright CSF. Yeah. So this is just a plain old uh, T2 spin echo. Oh, okay. But you're saying that the, uh, you can't even see it. It's the same color as CSF, which is why, oh. which is why they're really deceptive. And on CT, they're all almost the same density as CSF. So they almost look like, this almost looks like an arachnoid cyst. If you didn't have the diffusion, you'd probably call this an arachnoid cyst. You said that if it were sarcoid, it would enhance. If it were um, either a uh, schwannoma or, a, or a, a, like metastases or something, any other kind of a, of a neoplastic process would enhance. Um, Plus it wouldn't be this white on T2. Yeah, almost almost everything that's going to be um, masked like, is going to have some T2 darkness to it. Um, cellular things have a, have a lot of, have a lot, are a lot darker on T2. Um, but but before, you know, before we had diffusion imaging, we this was confusing. We couldn't tell the difference between an arachnoid cyst and an epidermoid, other than the fact that they grow. Okay, and this is kind of what uh, Dr. Degree was referring to earlier. Here's another patient with a microvascular infarct in a strategic location. So what cranial nerve or nerves could be affected here? So if you remember our, our, our uh, you know, neuroanatomical drawing, the, the nucleus of, of six is right here. And then and what, what, what loops around six? Yeah, so the, uh, the, the facial loop. So this patient presented with both six and seven because it was just very classically located in, in, in that location. Uh, okay, so this patient with a with a multiple tumor syndrome, which one? Yeah, so this is this is two, and what does MISMI stand for? Multiple inherited meningiomas or schwannomas, meningiomas and penomas. Yeah, so we get we get two of the three greatest cystic. We have bilateral acoustic uh, schwannomas, very characteristic of an N two, and then the penoma in circle spine. So uh, this is a classic miss me. All we have to have a meningioma, and the uh, and the hat trick is complete. Um, so Dr. Charles, Sir Charles Bell was a he was a, a, a late 17th, 1700s um, physician. So back then, um, nobody specialized. They were everything. He was a, an anatomist and a, and a and a physiologist and a, and a theologian and an artist and a neurologist. So. Back then, a doctor was just a doctor. But he's famous for identifying Bell's palsy. This is a classic appearance of a Bell's palsy. This is a T1 plus contrast. You see the entire facial nerve is enhancing pretty brightly. Now, the facial nerve has some normal enhancement. Uh, at the geniculate, there's usually a little, a little bit of faint enhancement, and the tympanic segment can enhance a little bit too, so it can be tricky. What should not enhance, though, is the labyrinthine segment, and the IAC segment of the facial nerve should not enhance. So when you see this enhancing, then it's gonna be a facial neuritis. Now, Bell's palsy doesn't usually need imaging unless it's atypical, but if you get it, this is what we're, or let's say you're trying to exclude something else, uh, this is a typical appearance. We sometimes call this a tuft of enhancement at the tip of the fundus of the IAC uh, for Bell's. Okay, this is a classic appearance of an acoustic neuroma, which we shouldn't call it that, because they don't usually involve um, that nerve. What, what is the, the most common nerve of, of origin of these, um, of these schwannomas? Yeah, they're usually the vestibular. So vestibular schwannoma is the most common, you know, proper pathologic ident identity of this. Um, for a long time, we thought there were, there were almost no cochlear schwannomas, but they found a couple of them that on, you know, on, on the path that they could identify as being coming from the cochlear nerve. Um, but by far the most common is, uh, is the vestibular. Um, so we really shouldn't call these acoustic neuromas. We should call them vestibular schwannomas. Um, now, one possible thing to be aware of is that a facial schwannoma can look an awful lot like uh, a vestibular schwannoma. They're running in the same place, for example. Now, what you look for with a facial schwannoma is the facial nerve is going to be coming right off here. Remember we said that there's a labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve right there? That's the geniculate ganglion. See that little bit of enhancement? 
that's normal to have a little bit of enhancement of the geniculate and maybe a little bit along the mastoid segment here. But if this were a facial schwannoma, what you'd look for is a tail of enhancement following the facial nerve bump here. Facial nerve schwannomas can be tricky because the facial nerve is such a robust nerve, sometimes the hearing loss will happen before the facial palsy. Even though the nerve is, even though the nerve of origin is the facial nerve, the hearing loss happens first because of the compression. So for us, for imagers, we have to be on our game. We have to always, whenever we see, we see a schwannoma, we look for the facial tail to make sure it's not a facial schwannoma because the last thing you want to have is your colleagues to go in and thinking that it's a vestibular schwannoma and the patient wakes up with facial palsy. Question. Yeah. Is it different from the dural tail that's talked about with a meningioma? Yeah, uh, so yeah, so a, a dural tail is a way to identify. So if you have an extra axial mass that looks like it's plastered up against a dural surface, and you're trying to decide, is it coming from a nerve like a schwannoma, which would be more like a ball, whereas uh, if it's a meningioma, it's coming from the dura, it's kind of like, like stuck in the dura, and the tail is where the, the mass kind of blends into the dural surface. So the dural tail is a way of saying that it's coming from the dura. The tail I'm talking about here is, it's still in the nerve. Think of the schwannoma as a tube of tumor, but the tube in this case is going into the facial nerve and the labyrinthine segment. So it's still a tube, but it uh, is, is poking in the direction of where the facial nerve goes. These are uncommon, um, and because they're uncommon, that's why you see an occasional misses, uh, but it's, unless, unless you're in the, in the otology world, you don't really pay attention to it, but it's, it's, a, it's a bad miss uh, to, to miss that, so that's why it's, it's part of our facial nerve evaluation that we, we are aware of that. Okay, so here's the patient with, uh, with facial palsy, um, and the abnormality is right here, and here, this is a post contrast, it's enhancing, um, this is much, much more enhancing than you should have at the genicular ganglion. Um, so uh, I, I kind of gave away the, the answer here, but um, what is the, and I've been saying it all along, what's the, what's the facial nerve segment right here? Here? That's the labyrinthine segment. And then this is the genicular segment right there, the, the genicular ganglion. And then the, the master segment comes back from here. Um, this is uh, an uncommon tumor, it's kind of a tricky one. Uh, we know what this is based on this appearance here. Do you see how they have this kind of little speckled bone right there? The bone that's kind of rubbed with little, little speculations in it. And then this mass is sent right smack in the, in the geniculate. Anybody not heard of this one? This is a facial nerve hemangioma. It's not a very common tumor, but it's got a, this characteristic honeycomb appearance of the bone is, is, um, is the, the telltale sign of imaging. Did that person have pain? I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think it was mostly... The, this, this is uh, originating from the facial nerve proper, so I think it's mostly facial nerve symptoms, but I don't... I don't know. But they may have had some pain uh, related to, like, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, GSP and, and headache and things like that. I, I guess the, 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 the epicenter or the center of this mass is the geniculate ganglion, the, the geniculate uh, bend in the nerve right there. And then finally, uh, what primary epithelial tumor is famous for perineural tumor spread? Curious, I don't. Yeah, uh, the one that we, that, that we think of most common is, is adenoid cystic. Is it has such an incredibly high rate of perineural tumor that whenever we see it, you, know, you worry a lot about it. But you know, mucoaps will do it. Um, um, squamous will certainly do it. Um, if you have a, a malignant transformation of a, of a benign mixed, um, you know, what they call the carcinoma, explanatory, those will also do it. Um, if this were lymphoma, you would certainly get a paraneural with lymphoma too. Okay, well, that's Good it. Good job. Thank you. Good job for all of you guys too. You did a pretty good job of answering. I hope you all got them right. <laughs> Take very much time. Um, so this is covering the facial nerve anatomy, uh, given that Dr. Degree is joining us today, and we both come from the northern woods of Minnesota slash Wisconsin. This is a view of the North Shore, uh, which leads up into the Boundary Waters, which is a series of lakes.
Um, How many of you have done it, the Boundary Waters? Yeah, it's highly recommended. Um, a series of lakes that you can portage between and just get lost uh, up in the northern woods and lakes of Minnesota. Uh, so to, as a brief overview of the facial nerve, as many of you know, it's a mixed sensory and motor nerve. A lot of this will be redundancy um, from our prior talk, uh, but maybe have a little more clinical context, hopefully. The motor root uh, supplying the muscles of facial expression, whereas the sensory root supplying taste to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, the external auditory meatus, and the retroauricular skin. And then the facial nerve also transmits the preganglionic parasympathetic innervation from the sphenopalatine and submandibular ganglion to the lacrimal, submaxillary, and sublacral glands. There is a really good video um, covering the virtual anatomy uh, in three dimensions um, that Elsevier puts on. Um, but even though we had such a good uh, three dimensional uh, evaluation of the facial nerve course with our radiology portion, I think we can <coughs> get that. Um, so, this will focus kind of what our BCSC focuses on as far as anatomy. Um, so here we have two diagrams, the one on screen left and the one on screen right, both showing the predominantly the motor nucleus of seven, uh, which is a cigar-shaped column that is about four millimeters long, located near the caudal third of the pons. You can see it here. Um, and then this is its. Uh, this is more of a three-dimensional representation versus a two-dimensional representation of the facial nucleus uh, in the motor portion, uh, highlighted in this orange color. You can see that it's ventral lateral to the sixth nerve nucleus, um, and ventral medial to the spinal nucleus of five, and dorsal to the superior uh, olive. You can see that the facial nucleus here on this screen left wraps around cranial uh, the abducens nerve or cranial nerve six, and forming the genu of cranial nerve seven, and it has a pro close approximation to the medial longitudinal fasciculus, and then it does also does have a close approximation to the vestibular nuclei. So you can see that a lesion anywhere along this course can uh, can be localized based on involvement of uh, other cranial nerves and or other structures. And then it joins the nervous intermedius. Um, here's another good uh, diagram uh, showing the motor course of the facial nerve. So including the supranuclear, nuclear, and infranuclear course. So the, the signal for motor Facial, motor, facial movements, sorry, starts within the primary uh, motor cortex and the precentral gyrus. The cortical bulbar fibers travel through the internal capsule down into the medial one third of the cortical spinal tracts and the cerebellar peduncles within the midbrain. The pathways, uh, as you see here, for the upper one third of the face, uh, facial function, including the brow and orbicularis, run parallel but distinct from the pathways for the lower two-thirds. Uh, the cortical bulbar fibers travel in the basis pontus, uh, but those that control the lower, uh, sorry, the lower facial muscles decusate at the level of the pons to synapse in the contralateral cranial nerve six nucleus whereas the cortical bulbar, bulbar fibers that control the upper facial muscles decusate and synapse on the contralateral cranial nerve 6 nucleus. Some of those fibers don't cross, reaching the ipsilateral cranial nerve 6 nucleus. So you can see the color coordination, uh, blue and green, uh, with the blue fibers here intervening the lower two-thirds and green intervening the lower two-thirds and then the upper uh, face being a upper portion of the face being a mixture. And that's clinically relevant, uh, which we can talk about. Uh, here's another good diagram showing the facial nerve, um, predominantly its motor function. 
Um, so again, the nucleus, the motor nucleus of the facial nerve is located in the caudal portion of the pons. It courses dorsal medially and encircles the nucleus of cranial nerve 6. After bending around 6, forming the genu of cranial nerve 7, it exits the pons uh, at the cerebe cerebello, cerebello angle um, and also combines with 5, 6, and near or close to 5, 6, and 8, as we talked about in previous slides. So the motor root of 7, cranial nerve 8, and then the nervous intermedius, which is the parasympathetics, uh, enter into the internal auditory meatus. Uh, some of those fibers, as depicted here, pass through the geniculate ganglion. Uh, and continue on as the chordae tympani, chordae, chordae tympani nerve, which carries, um, for example, taste to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, tongue highlighted in this blue picture. Um, it also transmits uh, paraphrenetics to the submandibular and sublingual gland. Um, so you can, you can follow, essentially, the motor nucleus in green. It wraps around six, enters the internal auditory canal, and then travels through the geniculate ganglion and uh, uh, sorry, hopping off to form the muscle uh, to innervate the muscles of facial expression in the lower picture. Compare that to the red fibers, which are the nucleus of the superior salivatory nerve, um, which also pass through the geniculate ganglion. Uh, synapsing on the sphenopalatine ganglion and then traveling forward to st simulate or stimulate the lacrimal gland. Also, pat the other fibers uh, traverse inferiorly, uh, joining the corda tympani nerve or helping to form it to innervate the sublingual and submaxillary glands. And then the nucleus of the facial psalteris is um, also joins within the internal auditory canal uh, to innervate the uh, anterior two thirds of the tongue for taste. Um, here is, this was pulled more from the oculoplastics perspective of specifically when we think about the branches of the motor component of the facial nerve um, to Zanzibar by motor car. Uh, so the temporal, zygomatic, uh, buccal, uh, mandibular, and cervical branches um, were commonly tested on the course of the temporal nerve specifically in its relation to the SMAS, uh, the temporal parietal fascia. Um, does anyone remember, uh, the distinction is the zygomatic arch. Does the temporal nerve, is it uh, superficial or deep to the SMAS uh, above the zygomatic arch? Above the superficial Correct, yeah. So, uh, and then below the zygomatic arch, it would be deep. Um, and so that has some, that uh, is often tested and is clinically relevant. There are a lot of anatomical uh, correlates to those, but uh, we, we won't cover those. Um, and then I think lastly, when thinking about the facial nerve and how it's both tested and how it presents and how we can localize, um, this is a great diagram that covers kind of the eight, I would say most common, but eight common um, presentations uh, based on lesion location. So number one here, you have a supranuclear facial nerve palsy. And based on its anatomy, how would a supranuclear facial nerve palsy typically present? Yep. Yeah. Um, exactly. And then how about, and that's because of the, the, um, uh, yeah, the anatomy that we covered previously. So then we have a, a nuclear cranial nerve or a facial nerve palsy that involves the nucleus. Um, how would that present? And what are some other accompanying features based on the size of the lesion that it could present with? Lateral facial nerve palsy. 
So we talked about involvement of sixth causing a, the palsy, but also the gaze preference uh, involving the PPMRF uh, if it's large enough. And then also uh, frequently is associated with ataxia and uh, occasionally a Horner syndrome on that uh, if lateral side. And then if we think about a lesion involving the three here, the cerebellopontine angle, um, what are some distinguishing features of a lesion there? Autonomics. Autonomics. Yeah, so you can have vertigo, ataxia, nystagmus, uh, involvement of uh, uh, impaired taste in the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Um, you can have uh, decreased hearing from involvement of cranial nerve eight. And then you think about a lesion involving the geniculate ganglion of four. Um, and four here, uh, also known as like you can get Herbie Zoster or Ramsey Hunt syndrome. How would that typically present? Or I should say, how can you different differentiate a lesion at four from that at three? And you can see here based on the cerebellar pontine angle having multiple uh, cranial nerve in that location uh, versus the geniculate ganglion. Um, the, really the distinguishing factor is that other cranial nerves are commonly not involved if it's involving the geniculate ganglion where they would be if it's involving the cerebellar pontine angle. Um, so then five. So, I'm, I'm, so geniculate involvement would give what? So it would give the same uh, as above uh, as a cerebellar pontine angle lesion, um, but it wouldn't involve the other, for example, cranial nerve eight. Yeah, it wouldn't be vestibular or nystagmus or anything like that. But you could get a geniculate neuralgia can also occur, yeah. right? And so you can see um, ear pain. Yeah. And then because there's some parasympathetic stuff going through there as well, then you could have uh, dry eyes and other problems on that side, right? Uh, and then, so this is where a lesion of the vidian nerve uh, can come into play. Uh, you can have, in this case, um, an ipsilateral tear deficiency uh, due to involvement of the vidian nerve, as we, as we talked about uh, with the geniculic ganglion lesion. Um, and it's mainly the lacrimal gland involvement. Um, so then a lesion at six in the fallopian canal, um, it can involve the stapedius, uh, the nerve to the stapedius muscle. Um, so presenting with changes in uh, hearing as uh, involvement of the chordae tympanae involving uh, loss of taste of the anterior two thirds of the tongue and impaired salivation. If we go down to seven, um, this is where the distal corda tympani, corda tympani um, so that would be involvement of just uh, isolated paralysis of the facial muscles. And then here down in eight, you can have it a lesion as the facial nerve exits the stylomastoid foramen. Um, you can have isolated involvement of any one of those branches and or um, all of them at the same time if it's at the stylomastoid foramen. So I think this is a good diagram to review uh, what, what, how can we localize a facial nerve lesion um, based on what causes it. And um, we'll watch, this uh, is a good short video on novel how to. Hi, I'm Kathleen Digri. I'm a professor of neurology and ophthalmology at the University of Utah uh, and the Moran Eye Center. And today we're gonna to talk about examining the facial nerve. Now, uh, we won't give a complete facial nerve examination because the facial nerve has autonomic features, et cetera, but what can you do quickly to look at the facial nerve? 
the first thing that I always do is look at the subject straight on and notice if there's any asymmetry in the facial muscles. And then I might ask the person to close their eyes as tight as they can. And here I'm looking at to make sure that the folding of the, the face is exactly the same on both sides and that they bury their eyelashes about the same as well. Now open up your eyes really, really wide and you notice that uh, you get furrowing of the brow upward and it's symmetric on both sides. When it's a peripheral lesion, you'll see weakness of the brow elevation and also of the face on the same side. If it's central, they'll be able to raise their eyebrows equally, but the lower face will be weak. The other way to look at the facial nerve is also just uh, ask them to smile. And, and uh, then I always say, do you know a joke? To get a real smile, because sometimes emotional uh, uh, subjects or emotional um, content can be observed differently in the face. So sometimes we do that. And, uh, and then sometimes I'll ask them to just blow out their cheeks like this. Excellent. And you can feel how much air is there, and they've got good facial strength. And that's the basic evaluation of the facial nerve. So I think uh, one thing that came up in clinic the other day is, you know, patients are often wearing masks, so having them remove their mask <coughs> in situation if you're assessing the facial nerve. Uh, and then I have just two brief uh, questions that are in our BCSC um, that are commonly tested. So the first one, a patient presents with continuous unilateral undulating contraction of the obicularis oculi and most of the facial muscles. What is the most, most common cause of these symptoms? Anyone have a guess? How old are they? Um, there's OCAPs, they didn't tell you. Yeah. Correct, it's pontine glioma is the most common cause. If it's just the orbicularis, I mean, everybody gets a little bit of myokymia once in a while if you drink too much Starbucks. But, um, but uh, this pontine glioma, if you see myokymia going on in the face, um, that's what you have to be thinking of. No, no, no. And myokymia is kind of like a little itty bitty jerk. And myokymia is more of an undulation going on continuously. Absolutely. But you know, frequently people have a hard time describing what they're having, and then you need to look, know what you're looking for. Uh, shoot, I should have presented. And then last one, uh, injury to the facial nerve can occur during what surgical maneuver? Dissection of the SMAS, SMAS uh, inferior to the zygoma, an eyelid crease incision, Dissection deep to the temporal parietal fascia above the zygoma, or dissection superficial to the periosteum or the zygoma bone. Yeah, it's uh, D periosteum over the zygoma bone. Okay. For the first question, yeah. Um, I know MS was a there, but is that more typical in adults versus trying to deal with kids? Like, is that like a thing? Can you say that again? For the BCSC, they said MS is like the most common in adults for like, like facial myokymia. Oh, facial myokymia is not common. Uh, and uh, MS, multiple sclerosis causing it, I haven't seen that before, but I've seen pontine gliomas cause it. And there's some really nice videos on um, a novel of if you've never seen facial myokymia and you know how to uh, differentiate myokymia from hemifacial spasm, right? Have you all seen hemifacial spasm? So you know what that is. Uh, yeah, our BCSC just comments that uh, pontine glioma is the most common, but demyelinating lesions such as MS can also cause it, uh, but doesn't specify whether or not uh, that is common. It's not. 
I, I, I don't think I've ever seen myochymia from an MS lesion. I mean, I see lots of uh, trigeminal dysfunction with MS and uh, facial weakness with MS, you know, because of and, uh, six nerve palsy with facial weakness with MS, because uh, you can get demyelination right by the facial nucleus. So good job.